Meanwhile, cut to Truss and Freddy. Honey didn't come back to the headquarters. Now they're freaking out. What does Truss and Freddy do? Obviously, they go break out. They go to rescue her. <laughs> I am so invested right now. Please take. This is amazing. <laughs> why why is it? Why is it a movie about this? They concocted a plan. Truss disguised herself as a German nurse. Welcome to the Badass and Bookish podcast, our first episode. How are you feeling? I'm feeling terrified, but great. Congratulations. Mm. Yeah, congrats. Our maiden voyage. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't have a shipping. How does this even work? Hey, are we bookish and badass or badass and bookish? <laughs> I'm Bren. And I'm Lan. <laughs> Wait, there was a bubble. Wait. In my <laughs> <laughs> there was a bubble. I'm Bren. And I'm Lan. And this is the Badass. This is the Badass and Bookish <laughs> Podcast. Podcast. <clears throat> so, what's your week been like, Lan? Um, it's been okay. Well, it's actually not been okay. It's been really bad. <laughs> But I mean, I'm here. How's your week been? I've had, well, because I was thinking about this question because of the podcast and I've had, it occurred to me that I've had a decidedly gay week. And then I was happy because I was like down, you know, that I've had like, Mm. I've been in a slump this week until it occurred to me that I've had a decidedly gay week. And what that should me gay ask me why was my week decidedly why gay? Was the week gay? Two reasons I'll be happy to tell you. First was A League of Their Own, which I am now the um, TV show on Amazon Prime. I'm now in my fifth rewatch because I just I, I was... watch all the episodes and then as soon as the credits stole on the last episode, I play it again. I'm it's playing while I'm cooking. It's playing while I'm working. It's just, I've got my little picture in picture on the screen. <laughs> Done. This a League of Their Own is, has been the most beautiful gift to the queers this year. And I'm very, very happy about it. And then there's obviously Taylor Swift, <laughs> who has also gifted us with the announcement of her new album coming on the 21st of October. So it's the belated birthday preview for me. Why is Taylor Swift a gay thing? She belongs to us. It's a long story. We can get into it. But there isn't enough time on this beetle. <laughs> <laughs> but Taylor Swift belongs to the, to the gays. Okay. And she does. League of Their Own, I actually have that earmarked for the weekend. So, yeah. Well done. Well I'm done. It out this weekend. Last weekend, I guess you could say, well, last weekend I was watching Trixie Motel. So okay. You was, had a gay weekend last weekend. I had a week, gay weekend as well. <laughs> a queer weekend. <clears throat> and then this week I kind of binge watched Hometown Takeover. <laughs> Of which is um, takeover. so they've so like kind of <clears throat> rehabbed their small town you know making small towns cool again I guess is the thing bringing the hipsters in and some people will go to gentrification but yeah uh, I mean it's kind of cool because the town's dying and I get it and like I really love the just the aesthetic I'm very much into like they use a lot of like retro vibe murals and things like that so it gives it a really nice feel okay and then yeah so I was watching so I watched hometown takeover this week which is where they took over now a different small town and the premise of the show is to uplift the town in four months so it's like business makeover house makeovers just re like getting the community excited again to be there instead of letting it die I'm going to check out a League of Their Own this weekend. Cool. I'm excited to hear what you think. Mm. 
I mean, I love the movie. I don't know if it's anything like the movie. Mm, a League of the Own movie <clears throat> is a cult classic and remains good. But what the show does that sort of sets it apart is because it's 2022, they they were able to go to places that the movie could not go in the 90s. Mm -hmm. So they tell the stories that the movie couldn't tell and it's still a lot of fun. It's still got the baseball fun. It's just that we delve a lot deeper into relationships, all kinds of relationships. And it's just, it gives you the warm and fuzzies. Okay. <clears throat> I'll check it out. Yeah. Well, I was going to check that. I'm not checking it out because you now this <laughs> five minutes. <laughs> I was gonna take uh, but you are checking it out because I brought it up 10 years ago. Well, my 10 years ago, long. Yeah. Week. What do you think of me? Okay. But yeah, but League of the so, Own on the list and then Lord of the Rings series on the list. Oh, you're going to do Lord of the Rings. Okay. I can't. I mean, the movies were fine. I enjoyed the movies, but I think I enjoyed the movies because everybody was making a big deal about it. This podcast is exactly what the title says. It's badass and bookish. We're going to talk about content that's either badass or bookish or badass and bookish. So for our maiden voyage, I was supposed to start with a fun fact. And so I had a fun fact tucked into my back pocket that actually goes with the theme of our maiden voyage because it's, it involves boats <laughs> or ships, okay. shall I say. But then I heard a fun fact this morning which brings us into that whole feminist, I don't know, arcana. Is I that mean, even the, the correct word to use? I love the word <laughs> arcana, so I'm going to say yes. Let's keep it in. <laughs> Can I just do, because it's really quick, two fun facts. So the first, the fun fact that comes out of my, that was tucked into my back pocket and through a happy series of accidents now goes with the whole theme of Maiden Voyage, which I keep saying, which was also not planned. So maybe it's fate. Anyway, so... You know about Anne Bonny, the mm -hmm. pilot? So like back in the day, she was obviously a prolific pilot or whatever, but being a woman couldn't be a pilot. So she dressed up as a man to sort mm -hmm. of get onto the pilot ship and whatever. She, but, so anyway, then there was another woman, gender bender um, pilot, Mary mm -hmm. Reed, and they found themselves on the same ship and then they found out that they, they found each other out, basically, that they were chicks, best as guys, not actually guys. But instead of calling or what's it, outing each other, they just entered into a beautiful little love affair mm. while they pirated the seven seas. Anyway, so then their pirate ship got taken over by... A group of boy pirates. <laughs> <laughs> and then Mary Reed and Anne Bonny were now taken aboard the boy pirate ship and obviously had to keep masquerading as guys to sort of not get caught out or whatever. And but then the captain, Captain Jack, discovered that Anne Bonny was actually a trick. And then to keep him from throwing her off the ship she seduced him mm. right and then when mary reed got found out to keep her from being thrown off off the ship and bonnie suggested that they just you know all love each other together so mary reed and bonnie and captain jack entered into this polyamorous pirate love affair and they ruled the seven seas and they went around like pilfering ships and whatever but as a thruple and they were happy mm -hmm. they lived happily ever after i mean i'm sure let me just check i think Anne was are executed are you sure who is captain jack because i thought Anne was with blackbeard ended with blackbeard Bonnie. captain jack was the guy who took her on his ship I like Calico the story. Jack. I read, I read a book about it a while back. 
when I say a while, I mean like 12 years ago. So oh, the, wow. the details are fuzzy, but that's really cool. And I love how the history books, you know, like, and they were roommates. <laughs> they were bachelors so, together. Yeah. yeah, so history, whenever they talk about Mary, Mary Reed and Anne Bonny, it's like, oh, they were friends. Hmm. They, were, they were pirate friends together. But like, human beings are crazy because we've now romanticized, right, the Anne Bonny and Mary Reed thing, but they were assholes. Like, they killed and Yeah, because they had to be, they were and... pirates. So it happened. They were great bad guys. They were. <laughs> so I see what you're saying. It's like they were bad people. Why are we romanticizing them? Yeah. I think it's a thin line. And particularly like when we, we speak about things, like when it comes to history, there were some like outstanding personalities. Let's call it that. But like, I think we have to be careful about glorifying it. But what if they're cool? Yeah, agreed. I cancel my last season. <laughs> I don't know who I was becoming five minutes ago. Let's let's start. <laughs> Not, you said you had two. Yes. So can I tell you my other fact just for funsies? Yeah. That okay. So the study was done, and it turns out. That lesbians earn 9.5% more than heterosexual females. It's called the lesbian wage gap or something like that. And it's why it comes down to like bottom line, just really quick. Obviously, there's a lot of factors involved, but it comes down to gender roles. And the fact that if you are a heterosexual woman, you are tasked with a lot of things that affect your career because you have to spend time taking you a caretaker, taking care of the home, blah, blah, blah. And those things are not commonly split with your male partner. Mm -hmm. He's the breadwinner and whatever, whatever. But in a lesbian household, it's shared equally. Everybody takes responsibility for everything. So everybody, all parties, are free or have the space to dedicate time and whatever to their jobs, to their careers and blah, blah, blah. So they end up earning more. That is a shocking statistic. Right? That's what I thought. And it's so unfair. Well, not unfair. Yes, unfair. So what are you reading this week? This week, I am reading... Oranges are not the only food. What? Is that what it's called? Yeah. So far, I'm underwhelmed. What is it about? It's about... Let me get the summary for you because I'm being bad at this. So it's like an autobiographical thing. Uh, Okay, so it's a coming of age. Is that what it is? About a lesbian girl growing up in England. Mm Mm-hmm. And so far, it's failed to grip me. I didn't go past the first chapter. Maybe I should give it time. So it's about a coming of age, her coming of age, but just the family. She grew up in a very religious, like her mother was fanatically Christian, which I'm sure that if I read further, the book is going to like delve into that. And obviously, the internalized homophobia probably Mm -hmm. etc etc but the author so it's an i'm listening to it on audible and the author's reading it and i'm not enjoying it i don't know (laughs) (laughs) i know i'm sorry jeanette winters winterson but okay so i'm probably gonna switch because I've got, did I, oh, I, t- I spoke to you about Mother for Dinner. Yeah. It was the last book that I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed. Oh my God, that book was amazing. So I feel like I want to do a reread of that, actually. <laughs> Swap out the, the lesbian coming of age that's not grabbing me. Okay. And go back to cannibalism. Sounds As cool. As one would want to do <laughs> Yeah. What are you reading? 
I'm still busy with this book, Dr. Shafali, a rabbit. Oh, movie. okay. So Ooh, that looks heavy. It is heavy. And I fell in love with her watching her in an interview with Marie Folio. I still sent you the interview. Mm. She's just the most captivating woman you meet them every now and then and it's this weird blend of you know the whole maiden mother crone energy it's just just this blend of all three that's just perfect and to say something i know it's putting her on a pedestal or whatever but (laughs) something comforting about listening to her speak it's almost like she knows and I guess this is how people feel about gurus. I'm hesitant to call her a guru, obviously. So anyway, after the interview, I bought her book. She's much better in person. Like she's a lot more charismatic or dynamic. She comes through in her interviews, her depth and her drive and her... Okay. Comes through in the interviews a lot better than the book, but I am enjoying it. And I'm going to read you something from it because it's very much about deconstructing deconstructing the the facade we built as children as women to gain the love we wanted so it's about going breaking down the ego which it essentially is to find out who we really are and what we really want and I think that's been like a huge focus of my studies is trying to figure out who am I actually like because that's a question I haven't been able to answer like Mm -hmm. past past what everybody expects me to be or past even what I'm good at what what is it that I'm about because you can't just be about things you're good like do you know what I mean anyway yeah so what people tell you you're supposed to be yeah so she says while it isn't something we are consciously aware of most women are trained from early girlhood to crave what I call the triple threat the need for approval validation and praise This triple threat is a means of glossing over the void that lies at our center, where our essence was intended to blossom. Lacking awareness of who we truly are, the triple threat becomes our unconscious surrogate, a sort of aphrodisiac. And I was like, yes. Because this approval, validation, and praise that manifests in so many different ways and in so many facets of your life that you don't even realize it's happening, that you're just acting like a dog right who yep. gets a biscuit uh, so, yes every time the bell rings yes so you know elevating. you do the right thing you behave yourself you don't sleep around you go to school mm-hmm. you get good grades here's your biscuit thank you patriarchy you know what i mean like yeah you need to restart it's so interesting this. also that you that you said um that you don't even realize that you're seeking the external validation so this it's mainly a question of who are we when we are stripped of our cultural conditioning free of our identification as someone's daughter sister wife or mother and that's Mm. particularly important because whatever makes a good mother wife sister or daughter might not be inherently who you are and then again what is a good mother sister i was just gonna say that exactly yeah we're all supposed to be good but what is good good depends on societal and cultural norms and that changes all the time Mm -hmm. and the norms are usually like constructed around ways in which we can serve and Mm -hmm. who are we serving (laughs) at all times (laughs) so i mean the book like just listening to her speak just her whole demeanor i was left in awe and i guess i was kind of experienced expecting the same experience from the book but the book is less of that. And maybe it's just one of those things. But I, fe- I feel the same way about a lot of people. I feel like it doesn't come through the same in the book as seeing them or listening to them. But it is it definitely is something I would still recommend. There's some good points like for journaling. Every chapter kind of okay. should look like a different thing. But you, at the end of the day, you're still the one who has to like, okay. Do the work. Yeah. Definitely. That sounds cool. So I'm going first. Yes. And I have a true crime story for you Mm -hmm. about a lady killer. Okay. And her name is Jolly Joseph. 
and mm -hmm. the case is referred to as the coup d'etat cyanide killings. Okay. So coup d'etat is a small village in South India and cyanide was used in all the murders besides one. So we therefore have the okay. coup d'etat cyanide killings. Okay, so there were six deaths in one family over the course. This is so messed up. There were six deaths in one family over the course of 14 years, starting in 2002. And then, so 2002 for 14 years, people be dying in the family. <laughs> okay. And nobody does anything for over like a decade. Young anyway. people. Oh. I'll get there. Okay. So then in October of 2019, then in 29, so it started in 2002, 2019, the cops are like, wait a minute, <laughs> these are all murders. And they were all committed by the same person, Jolly, Miss, Miss Jolly Joseph. Miss Jolly So, Joseph. yeah, she's also known as the cyanide killer. She was arrested for the murders of her first husband and then five others that she committed husband. between, yes, no. that she committed between her first husband. So that was the initial arrest was for the murder of her first husband. But then also the five others that she committed between 2002 and 2016. And according to the police, she confessed to all of them. Okay. So let's get into it. But... Jolly, <laughs> Jolly okay. married Roy Thomas. <laughs> Jolly married Roy Thomas. And they had two sons. Friends and family describe her as chatty, friendly, church going. She's just like the consummate mm -hmm. good wife. Then on the 22nd of August 2002, the 50, 57 year old mother in law says that she's getting sick. She starts like she's getting sick after she started a new medication. She's a retired school teacher. And there's like a few weeks of her being sick and whatever. And then after eating a bowl of mutton soup, she began frothing at the mouth and died. So nobody thought anything of it because she had been sick for weeks leading mm. up to this mutton soup mm. debacle. They're like, okay, this poor woman, she's been ailing for so long and then she drops dead. She's not exactly young. Oh. Well, well, that's 57 is not old, but anyway. Then, so, so nobody thinks anything of this mother-in-law dying after the mutton soup. Six years later, in 2008, Anama and Anama, Anama Thomas, that was the mother-in-law's name. So her husband, 66-year-old Tom Thomas, died after eating a plate of tapioca pudding. And this tapioca was made, Jolly made the pudding and served it to him. Then he died and it looked like, nobody thought it was suspicious because his death looked like he just had a heart attack. And nobody paid attention to the fact that he was eating a meal prepared by no. Charlie either. Because he's, he's an old man. His wife just died. Okay, he had a heart attack. Then no further investigations were made. So, and because it was so far apart as well, this is six, six years later. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't oh, make okay. a, a connection like mm -hmm. between the food, the food and death. So it was long enough after his wife passed away. And then and also, her husband is still alive at this point. Her husband is still alive. And Jolly was also present at both. She was there when her mother-in-law died. And she was there when her father-in-law died. But nobody raises any eyebrows mm -hmm. at this. Then, obviously, it turns out after his, the father-in-law's death, his will is made out to Roy and Jolly, the married couple. So they get everything. Then in 2011, three years after his father died, 40-year-old Roy Thomas, the husband, drops dead after eating a plate of curry and rice. <laughs> so reports say that he felt sick after eating it. He ran to the bathroom to go throw up, but he ended up not making it. Jolly reported to the cops or whoever, everybody that it was a heart attack. And it runs in the family because his father also died of a heart attack. Mm -hmm. So then, um, but this time it didn't fly. The uncle, um, Roy's uncle, called for an autopsy because he was suspicious. Mm. Then when they did the autopsy, they found traces of cyanide in the autopsy. Oh. So now it's, 
you can't sell it as a hot tech but jolly is not to be taken down so easily she says she changes the story and she's like well then it must have been suicide <laughs> that roy thomas wanted to take his own life mm -hmm. and then the story comes out that they've actually been having financial problems and he was under a lot of stress and pressure and whatever and obviously he decided to opt out because he couldn't take it anymore so the family accepted okay fine he killed himself he took a lethal dose of cyanide and killed himself um after his death the family finds out that roy changed his will so even though they had sons roy mm -hmm. changed his will and left everything to his wife jolly <laughs> okay so Wait, they have, were the and, sons grown up at this point or were they? So they were, I, I don't know. I think they were big. Okay. They were a little grown. They weren't adults. But I mean, there was nobody else in the world, not his, his siblings, not Roy's siblings. Mm. Nobody else except Jolly. Okay, fine. So then Roy's brother was a little bit confused. Like, why didn't... Because that wasn't his brother, you know, it was unlike his brother to just cut everybody out of the wall and blah, blah, blah. And um, he was upset that the police didn't investigate the cyanide lead further than finding out that there was cyanide in his, in his system and Jolly saying, oh, well, he killed himself. He took it, mm -hmm. you know, to whatever. So then um, Roy's uncle, Matthew, was trying to find out how he even got hold of cyanide to begin with. But he couldn't um, get any answers. So he just left it. He couldn't um, figure out. But it was a question that was sort of like plaguing, mm -hmm. plaguing him. But he just let it drop because the police obviously weren't interested in taking it any further. So then three years later in 2014, 67-year-old Uncle Matthew dies. So Matthew yeah. with the question of, how does he even get the cyanide? Three years later, this guy... Drops it. But listen, I have to commend Jolly on her patience because she leaves really? such long gaps between the murders, which definitely helps because it's mm -hmm. not like, can you even call it serial killings? I don't know if serial killings have sort of time, like they have to happen within a certain time period probably to be considered serial. Anyway, so three years later, 2014, Uncle Matthew is dead following a visit by Jolly. So it turns out that she gave him a drink mixed with cyanide and then left and came back a few hours later to find him close to death. Then she gave him, so he's like busy dying. She gives him a glass of water with more cyanide in it. <laughs> and then oh just like told everybody, oh, you know, it was a heart attack. He died of a heart attack. <laughs> then, <laughs> yes. So then Jolly ends up marrying her late husband's cousin. So Roy Thomas's cousin. Saju, I think is how you pronounce it. Mm. But this happened only after she killed Saju's wife, because Saju was married. The cousin was married, and they had a two-year-old daughter together. But Jolly decides she wants Saju, so she needs the wife out of the picture. So she ended up killing his wife. In 2014, the two-year-old choked to death <gasps> while eating something at her older brother's Holy Communion. So she got the kid out of the way as well. In 2016, the um, so first 2014, she got the toddler out of the way. Uh, she choked to death while eating something at her brother's Holy Communion. Then in 2016, Saju's wife died in Jolly's lap after a dental appointment. So she went to the dentist, Jolly was there, <laughs> and police reports placed Jolly at all of the deaths. Every single one of them that died, Jolly was there. And they still, still no investigation. Oh Nothing God. fishy here, you know. So in 2017, a year after his wife dies, Jolly now marries Saju. And this is when people are like, she's marrying this man? Like after his wife just conveniently dies and blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah. So then Roy's brother starts looking into it he starts looking into it further because obviously the, the cops aren't doing anything the police is just <laughs> accepting all the heart attacks in this family so then the brother decides to take it upon himself and he starts investigating 
mm-hmm. and he starts speaking to the the rest of the family who are alive, like guys, something is not right with Jolly, and they're like, no, I don't know. I think you're crazy because she's so nice. She goes to church every week. Mm. She's so kind and helpful and, you know, and they thought that he was just, um, what's it? A case of sour grapes because he got nothing in the world. Mm-hmm. So now he's sort of uh, being trying to be spiteful. But then when, so this has been happening over the years, obviously they're just telling him he's crazy. He's just upset he didn't get anything. But then she married Saju and then the family started coming around like, okay, maybe you're not so crazy because what the hell is this even about? So then in August, 2019, um, Roy's brother goes to the police and he requests that the case be open. All the cases, all six Mm -hmm. deaths, reopen all the cases. Because he had found out that she was lying about her job because she told everybody that she was a college professor at NIT University in India. But when they checked it out, NIT said that she's never been employed there. But she had the staff ID card and she drove to work every morning. So for as long as she's been in this family, she's been going to like she's work been, there. Yes, she's been going to work and lying, saying that she's a professor. But so she obviously she faked the ID card or stole one or whatever because they they said that she's she'd never been employed there but when they tracked the id card they found that she has been going to the university library like a lot she's been spending a lot of time there and Mm -hmm. when they researched like what she was doing there they found out that she was looking at she was doing research on doses of cyanide poisoning to make it look like natural deaths i'm like seriously way to cover your tracks girl so (laughs) She was going to the university reading up on how much is just enough that it will look like a natural death kind of a thing. So then once they discovered that, they discovered that she's actually been lying about everything. They like the whole time that they'd known her because she told, she told them that she had a postgrad, postgraduate degree, but it turns out she was actually a college dropout. And then obviously all of these things are comp- compounding and the police is like, okay, fine. We're going to exhume the bodies mm-hmm. and look at them obviously through a different lens that maybe you, this is murder. And then they realized that all of them were actually killed. So they arrested her in October, 2019 and she didn't mess them around. She confessed to all the murders. And all of them were cyanide, except the mother-in-law, <laughs> because the mother-in-law was always pressuring her to, like, get a job. And because apparently she wasn't the professor at this university for the whole time that they were together. So mm-hmm. in the beginning of the relationship, the mother-in-law was pressuring her to get a job. If she's got a postgrad, why doesn't she go work and blah, 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 mm-hmm. to ease the financial burden on her husband? So, and basically it just comes down to she didn't like her mother-in-law. And so she (laughs) went to a vet and got a poison called dog kill. Oh my God. (laughs) And the police believe that this is what she used to kill the mother-in-law. So she used dog kill. Oh gosh. And so getting the cyanide was the other thing that they looked into. Like how did she get enough cyanide for five murders um and they it was one supplier one supplier and jolly told them that she needs the cyanide to kill her at so the person was like okay cool yes cyanide to kill your rat every every few years or so you need you have a rat problem apparently Mm -hmm. um so then they found out that um, a lot of gold ornaments and jewelry and things like that that belonged to Sha Zhu's wife, the woman that she killed, was missing. And it turned out that she had stolen all the gold from her victims, basically, and pawned them. So it's just like, besides the walls that were made out to her and all the money she was getting, she was also stealing from them, which wow. is terrible. And so they just ruled that that, um, that money was her motive. But I don't know about that because 
how could money be the motive like for the mother-in-law for instance money definitely wasn't the motive for Shaju's wife she's just a crazy crazy person who like if she doesn't like you then she just eliminates you from her life or is this a case of <laughs> she didn't deal with the facade that she built up <laughs> to look for what was it validation acceptance and you know yeah. so that's why she pretended to be a lecturer that's a very high prestige job maybe yeah and she why else would you lie about your education is because you want people to think more of you more of you um killing the husband needed, yes. i mean that's a normal thing right like people I do that so. often. people do that often <laughs> But like the wife and the baby, that 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 was messed Damn. up. So with the wife, um, the wife had gone because um, Shaju and his wife had an older son, mm -hmm. and the son was at the dentist that day. So obviously the the wife was with him at the dentist, and then Jolly shows up. I don't know for model support, but she wasn't feeling well or whatever. And then Jolly gave her some pills to feel better but the pills were laced with cyanide. so she never killed his son no that's very interesting so the son but she didn't kill him but i mean i don't know this is she did what she did was worse because when she married his father she was abusive mentally and physically abusive towards the son and like when he when they after her arrest and they were obviously giving statements and whatever he called the torture he said that he was tortured by her and i don't know if she did that this is the thing like um i don't think it was money that was driving her. i think that she was just money. a sick person and she probably kept why she killed the two-year-old because she was a girl get her out of the way keep the son to sort of and torture him to keep the dad in check i don't know do you know what i mean like mm. And then when they searched her house after she was arrested, they found um, a bottle of cyanide or what they thought they suspected it was cyanide. And then Jolly told them that she was planning on using it on herself. If she was ever caught, she kept this, you know, like a fail safe. Like if they ever mm -hmm. catch me, I'm going to kill myself. Um, but because the raid on her house was obviously a secret, she didn't know that they were coming after her or that they were even investigating it was all done sort of like hush hush mm. so she didn't know they were coming after so she didn't have time to kill herself to kill herself yeah and then after they got her she named Shaju her new husband as a co-conspirator in his wife's murder like he told me to kill her he was in on it it was his plan because he wanted to be with Jolly but he's denied everything and he also never requested an autopsy on his wife's body. So people are like thinking, okay, maybe he was in on it. But anyway, so in on the 1st of January, 2020, this started in 2002. Jeez. But on the 1st of January, 2020, Jolly was charged with the murder of Roy Thomas, her husband. And then by early Feb, she was charged with the five other murders as well. Sure. And... Um, when she was in prison, she made phone calls to all the witnesses, like the family members and neighbors who were being questioned. And she tried to like buy the, uh, what do you call it? Mm -hmm. Alliance. Richard. Yeah. Try to influence them to help her to get out. And then obviously it didn't work. So on the 27th of February, 2020, she attempted suicide by biting into her wrists. <gasps> and then like, uh, rubbing them on the walls of her prison cell to like try and ugh. anyway they hospitalized her they rushed her to hospital and she survived because they were probably like you are not getting out of this that easily woman but, but all of I these mean, things like she's not mentally well i don't think it's money no. because if it was just money then uh, i don't know i don't think so especially like biting your wrists and Somebody was going to bite into their wrist to kill themselves. They are not. They are not well. Who's going to kill a two-year-old to get out of the way so you can have a daddy? 
I, that's not, anyway, so um, the Indian government put a gag order on the case and that's why for a long time nobody heard anything about it they didn't want the story getting wow. out which is i don't know probably like reputation i don't know i mean how is like <laughs> i can understand if there's been a string know, of hijackings of foreigners in their country that they want to put a gag order on but how does this this that there was media happens. media silence for over a year because of i don't know they don't say but I mean, you can imagine. <laughs> then in October of 2020, she was granted bail in the case of her mother-in-law. Because they were, they were tying the murders separately. Mm -hmm. So in the case of her mother-in-law, she was granted bail. And her defense argued that because she confessed, um, she was, or not, they argued the confession for her, the murder of her mother-in-law can't be taken into account because it was a coerced confession. It was done outside of court proceedings, blah, blah, blah. And um, it happened, the confession happened several years after the murder. Anyway, they argued that it was, like she was a totally different person back then who bought the dog kill poison for her mother-in-law than she was now and therefore oh. you know they must so anyway they granted her bail, bail but because of the other five murders she did not get bail for those so she's still in jail yeah and then on the 21st of january last year she filed no, she didn't file. The prosecution filed an appeal against the bail grant. And they won. So she's still she's still in prison. She's not going anywhere. She's not going anywhere. She's still in what? Prison in Kozikodi district of Kerala. But yeah, that's the case of Jolly Joseph, the Sinai killer. That's very messed up. I mean, she's got patience. She has right 14 years. <laughs> it's like, okay, you said this thing to me four years ago. Here's your cookie. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. But the the worst for me was when she spiked um Uncle Matthew's drink. So she leaves him to now let him yes. Um, summer in his cyanide and then comes back to help but then gives him water laced with more cyanide I don't know that's I don't buy the money motive there it's crazy she was served a divorce notice in <laughs> yes <laughs> so I, I mean I find it hard to believe that her new husband is completely innocent I mean can you yeah. leave that clueless Especially when their marriage happened after so many deaths. And after Roy's brother has been making so much noise about her. Mm. Like he's been talking to everybody. Guys, look into Jolly. Something's not right here. And then the cousin just goes ahead and marries her anyway. After his wife and child dies. Because who gets the money now? The parents' money that she inherited. I don't know. They actually don't say what happened to the money situation. Because it's probably all still hers. And maybe like, that's why the cousin married her. Mm, to get it. he wanted in on that family money. Because Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying it's not her fault. But I mean, if somebody is mentally unbalanced, it's very easy to egg that along for your own agenda if you know what I mean oh. and also like okay so I don't know much about I'm not gonna make assumptions about India but I mean I wouldn't be surprised if she took the fall for for uh, Shaju Shaju for the yeah. cousin well she didn't take the fall she named him as a co-conspirator mm -hmm. Because why would but she admit to everything and they believe her? And when she names him as a co-conspirator, right? 
because now she's got nothing to lose. She's already committed to it. She's already, oh. you know, confessed. So why? It's not like that's going to oh, get Well, they probably going. believe him the same, for the same reason that they believed her for 14 years that everybody was having heart attacks. Hmm. Because they're just incompetent. Wow. I mean, it's very bad, but also like <laughs> she was dedicated. Right? That is dedication. To bide your time and know that this is what you're leading up to. But also, the thing that I find underwhelming, and this is probably ugh, it's terrible because people died. But like if you have, for instance, six years to plot a murder, it's going to be curry and rice. <laughs> I mean, you were let down by the creativity of it all. <laughs> I was. I was very underwhelmed. I was like, that's a terrible thing to say. And I mean, obviously, I feel really terrible for the people who lost their lives and don't wish that on anybody. But yeah, you've, you've had six years to plot a murder and, and you go with like, change up your mo girl like well i uh, know the thing is don't fix it if it ain't broke it's probably where she was at like i used cyanide passed it off as a heart attack they bought my story so i'm good i will be doing this forever apparently forever Okay, well, thanks for that story. Yeah. So it's time for your question. My question. Yeah. So today's Q and A is: oh, okay. What is a book you're embarrassed to admit that you actually enjoyed? Oh my god! Like I was never embarrassed. Oh wait, no. Why am I just? Yeah, so just something you enjoyed more than more than you'd like to admit. <laughs> um, I'm struggling to think of anything except one, which is not really a bad thing. Well, I suppose I don't know why I'm easily embarrassed. I'm embarrassed about everything, but I'm thinking of, are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> why is that embarrassing? I don't know. I just feel like because. Especially like um, when people are like, what are books, you know, that changed you as a child and that still stick with you today? And then they come up with these amazing books like um, Matilda or, you know, like something like that. That seems a lot more profound. And then the only thing I can think of is I'm 38 and I still to this day think about, oh, you think God is me, Margaret, that book shifted something in me and I don't know why I'm embarrassed about it but that's just and then obviously oh I've got one a real <laughs> one I had a Daniel Steele phase oh I remember <laughs> Steele I remember that phase. and I would read every single release and I devoured those books, Daniel Steele, for like, I don't know, from the age of like 10 to maybe, I was, I was 13 when I read my first Stephen King. So for the, for the three years leading up to I don't know, the pipeline, the Daniel Steele to Stephen King pipeline, I don't even know how that works. But for those three years, that was actually all. I didn't read anything else. I only read Daniel Steele novels. And I am ashamed. <laughs> mm. I am ashamed. I'm so glad, so happy that I walked into, I fell down the Stephen King rabbit hole. Ugh. Okay, so are you there, are you there God? It's me, Margaret. It's all safe. I think book is very close to my heart. I mean, there's no reason. I can understand with your current taste in books why you're self-conscious about your steel era. But <laughs> um the are you They're all books? the same. Yeah. They are all the same. And I stopped so that was like age 14. Read my first Stephen King. 
And I actually didn't touch romance again. I don't know for the rest of my life. I mean, only this year did I start reading romance. No, uh, it depends because queer romance. I started reading probably like two years ago, two or three years ago. Mm-hmm. And that's my foray back into the, but it's still not, not my first, it's never my first choice. So in other words, Daniel Steele is pretty much the last, <laughs> the last and lasting picture of romance in my, in my brain. I did try and play with this one time. <laughs> I don't so, know. Yeah. I mean, I've only recently embraced the fact that I really enjoy romance. And I think it's because I grew up with you as an older sister and your constant judgment about, like, what's cool. You know, like, as a younger sister, you want to be considered cool. <laughs> so, like, I would oh. pair it. Until Stephen King happened and I read a Stephen King book and I was like, this is not for me. I cannot, I, I can't be who you want me to be. <laughs> Thank you for not putting cyanide in my drink. It's I still killing you. I decided to just um, lean into Leave my choices. <laughs> um, that being said, though, for some strange reason, and this is, something we spoke about recently is I was very self-conscious even with myself like I wouldn't let I wouldn't let myself admit it to myself that I enjoyed <laughs> listen to Riley's um seven sisters oh I remember <laughs> like, I you really were on like this it. weird like whenever you brought it up you would have this disclaimer like a 15 minute disclaimer before going into the book but yeah I don't know why but I like it's almost like I, I wouldn't let myself be that person. But um, I actually really enjoyed it and will be buying all of them to add to my intentional library. That's great. Have like, like you have a reading area you're, you're embarrassed by, but I actually don't. Really? Mm. I think because I'm still... What about the Sweet Valley? Sweet Valley High. I'm not embarrassed. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not embarrassed by my Sweet Valley days. Um, I'm sorry to anybody who likes Daniel Steele. But yeah. I just... Well, I liked it at the age of, what? 10. <laughs> 10 to 13. Um, but I think, you know what it is? It's because I'm not like a... Like, cere- I don't want to say cerebral reader, but like, so I like fun. Like, it's like with my TV choices. I like the escapism mm. and I, I like happy endings. Do not get me invested in something oh. and then do like a when calls the heart vibe because what when calls the heart in the TV show. Oh, I was heartbroken. I'm Is so that about the cop? Like the guy on a horse? Mountie Jack, yes. Oh, and I never watched it. I am heartbroken. I don't want real life to come into my world. Okay. There. There's enough real life in real life. And yeah, so I think that's it. And like you, when you were saying a few minutes ago, like how when people talk about the books that change their life in childhood, then you say that. That's how I feel. And maybe that's how everybody feels. Because, like, you come up with these great titles of books that changed your life. And I'm like, I haven't even read that. <laughs> like, for me, it's like, oh, maybe, like, Order of the Phoenix. I don't know. Like, oh. I think. I don't think my titles are great. Like, I feel a lot of book shame when I'm on Book Talk, for instance. You know and what? We like, need to wow, really people are reading like amazing. Because things. I really think we feel like people judge us more than what they actually are. <laughs> because secretly we all read Steel. Secretly we all enjoy Lucinda Riley, and that's okay. Like, why aren't we allowed to? Why do we only have to care about the deep, profound literature? And you know, we don't only have to care about deep, profound literature. 
but I mean, they are titles that mar, that mar <laughs> your, your track record. I think we should just be more accepting of people's literary preferences. I'm accepting. Oh, no. No, I'm not. You I will know. judge you by what you read. Yep. Yep, 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 yep. I will judge you by what you read. And I will not change. Because, I mean, the things... The thing is, what you are putting into your brain, that's who you are. You know? At least my Daniel Seal era was between the ages of 10 and 13. So it's done now. <laughs> so now I'm putting... <laughs> Tender is the flesh and mother for dinner into my brain. So I don't know what that says about me. <laughs> people eating people. I'm just there. This is this is the stage of life that I'm that I'm in. I again, so my escapism, because I also read for escapism, but I like the darkness because that's where <laughs> that's where I feel at home. Known. I feel known and home and safe in the darkness. Do you know what? I avoid the darkness because I think that's actually probably like me avoiding my own darkness, not ready to mm-hmm. confront my own like shadows or whatever. Um, but I'm okay doing that for now. Mm. <laughs> that's fine. I don't know what it is, but it's like a pool that I feel like even with it's the it's not so much the darkness, but it's that yeah, it is. It's the shadow like of the human psyche. So. Mm. The things that people don't want people to see. I like reading about them. And I like reading how it just fucks up everything or makes everything great. Okay. Because it gives me hope. The darkness gives you hope. Yes. Uh, I don't know. I don't need to explain it. I don't need to make sense of it. I know that I you enjoy it. You have to justify yourself. And maybe that yeah. is the takeaway from this question segment. No justification mm-hmm. necessary ever. Yep. So. Your turn. Are you ready turn. for this? I think so. So today I have a story for you about Truss and Freddy Uverstirchen. They were sisters, I thought I'll carry on the sister theme, okay. um, who were resistance fighters in the Second World War. Dutch resistance fighters in the Second what? World War. What were their names? Truss, T-R-U-U-S, and Freddie. So Truss was the okay. oldest sister, um, two years older than Freddie. And just to kind of give you some background, their mother was a communist activist in the community before World War II. So she would host a lot of political meetings in their home. They were also very poor, very much living off welfare, and their parents were divorced. So it was just the two of them, their mother and their younger stepbrother, who was living together. And before the war reached the Netherlands, they actually hosted Jewish refugees on the way out. So a lot of times, because their mother was so active, even though at that point it was actually illegal in the Netherlands to give shelter to refugees. So Mm -hmm. they would give up their beds. And there's I watched this documentary, and I'll actually I'll link it in the description when when we put this up, where uh, Freddie is actually interviewed as a as a uh, older woman, obviously, and she's I think she's 90 in the documentary. And they go to the house where she grew up pre-war. Um, wow. And she hadn't stepped foot in. She, hasn't, she hadn't been back there since when they left in the war. And so mm. she was saying how like when the refugees would sleep over, she would push two armchairs together in the lounge. So her, her mother and her stepbrother would sleep there. She would push two armchairs together. She would sleep in that. And then have two Jewish refugees in her bed and two Jewish refugees in Triss's bed. So I think it's important to understand that they come from a woman who saw injustice and did something about it. She wasn't Mm. just standing by and letting things happen. And that's really important to understand like how different they were, because I think the one stat that I read was when 
the when the Netherlands was conquered, about 90% of Dutch people just wanted life to go on as normal. 5% became sympathizers and collaborators with the Nazis, and 5% of the entire population became part of the resistance. Wow. Of that 5%, there was 10 to 15 women. Wow. Yeah. So they were something else. Um, when the war That's eventually amazing. came in 1939, 1940, Freddie was 14 and mm -hmm. Tris was 16. And when, when they were at the house in the documentary, Freddie was saying she can remember how she woke up one morning and she heard her mother and Tris in the garden downstairs talking. And she remembers thinking like, what's going on? Like, why am I not being involved? Like, it sounds like something important is happening. So she goes downstairs in her pajamas and she's like, what's, what's going on? And then her mother tells her it's war. And Truth says, it'll be five years. And she was like, how did she even know that? Like, from 1940 to 1945. And it's just, they were like, they were kids. Like, do you remember what we were like? At Babies. And 16. Babies. And just like that, their childhood's over. Um, up until that point, the role that they were playing was through their mother's connection um, with the communist resistance they would help distribute literature that told the truth. I think it actually was called The Truth, obviously. Oh, so not Daniel Steele. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So literature about what was actually going on and uh, they would ride their bike and distribute it. And then once the war eventually did come to the Netherlands and the Germans would put up these propaganda posters then the girls would actually go out and put the truth over it. So they would oh, stick. Oh, wow. Like when the Germans were recruiting men and whatever, they would stick warnings over it. And I mean, they could have been killed if they were caught doing any mm. of that during that time. But yeah, so anyway, about, I think it was in 1941, they were, their mother was visited by one of the men who put resistance groups together so they were in a town mm -hmm. called Harlem that was the city in the yeah. Netherlands um, it. and they were obviously there was various resistance groups being mobilized underground and because of their mother's connection political underground connections one night a, a man came with a hat according to Freddie came to the door in a hat and came in and had a conversation with them and asked their mother for permission to recruit them to the resistance because they were women, well, young girls, actually, mm -hmm. they wouldn't be suspected. So to play a more active Holy shit. role. Wow. And then the mother. And agreed. they were obviously, they were obviously making an impact with they what were, they were doing outside of being part of a group or whatever that got them noticed. Yeah. But wow, what a decision for a mother to make. Exactly. Exactly. Because that's like goes against every instinct because they have to leave. Obviously, they have to go underground. Yep. It goes against your every instinct as a mother to say, like, yes, take my kids. Yes. And I mean, especially you, because your games. one daughter is basically Freddie's age, almost Freddie's age. Yep. To send yep. her to fight. Like, it's. <laughs> It's crazy, but apparently, so their, their mother agreed, giving them one piece of advice before they left the house. And she tells them, always stay human before oh, wow. they enter this whole other world. So anyway, so that kind of marks the start of their resistance careers, I guess you can call it. So they would do things like a big part of, of what they were asked to do is, yes, distributing the the underground resistance literature but they would also escort children to safe houses because especially mm -hmm. not so much freddie because freddie also had dark hair so tris wasn't so keen on freddie going out by herself just in case she oh, was okay. mistaken. but tris had light hair and she was a little bit older so if she was walking with the kid it wouldn't be as suspicious they would just kind yeah. of 
So they played a large role in what was called the Kinder Transport, which is getting Jewish kids out of Germany and to Britain. So during the war, Britain actually changed their immigration policies to allow a lot more Jewish German kids under the age of 17, I think, could could come in and seek asylum. So I think more than like 10,000 kids were were taken to to Britain. But this surprisingly became a role that Truss actually really didn't like because you didn't always get the kids to the safe house. Mm. And and that's something that they actually don't speak about a lot in their interviews. In fact, they they actually just said we don't speak about that. And Mm. I mentioned in one of her memoirs where she, the one instance that really like left a scar i guess was Mm. they were going across the i think it's called the north sea canal rowing yeah with kids and one other comrade and then something happened but the they were found because the north sea canal was constantly being patrolled and he stood up and he kind of knew they were done for and shouted Mm. something along the lines of well take your best shot or something like that and then he was killed and the boat was riddled with bullets and capsized. And she oh, and all the goodness. kids, and she couldn't save them, obviously. So, oh, no. so like they preferred the militant duties to the, even though it was necessary, obviously, I think them themselves being so close to actually being children or actually being children, yep. I think it was obviously a, a lot more traumatic to deal with yeah and that's a big uh, big responsibility so obviously there's no way you're not going to carry that with you if you don't get the kids there safely definitely and I actually want to show you um this is what so this was Freddie and you'll see that she's wearing pigtails in the the one Mm. photo and that's actually one of their strategies was to make her look as young as possible because when she wore pigtails she could pass as like a 14 year old and then they really wouldn't be suspected yeah but obviously the more time they spent with the resistance eventually they were recruited into something called the rvv which was a much smaller faction but a much more i guess drastic uh, much more drastic measures were taken by them. And I think there was only seven people in it. So yeah. with the RVV, the original vision was there were so many resistance groups across the Netherlands. They wanted to unify and they wanted okay. to take out high impact targets. So really kind of high ranking officers, German officers, but also Dutch collaborators. So people who sold out Jewish people in their communities, that's who they okay. were targeting. And then also strategic targets like railways, trains, things like that. So that's when Freddie and Truss actually started getting involved in bombing. So bombing railways. And that's when they started what they call liquidations. And that was the assassinations. That's what they called assassinations. So they became assassins. They became assassins. Which was, (laughs) it blew my mind. And to the point where, so they eventually meet another resistance, female resistance fighter called Hani Schacht. And you might know her name. She is very, very well known as a resistance fighter in the Netherlands, but I don't think outside the Netherlands. And so, so apparently during this time, like you, you weren't allowed to have bicycles, right? You had to have a permit and the only people who could have a permit for a bicycle were nurses. So that was often their cover. Okay. Because the bicycle... So they pretend to be nurses. Yeah. The bicycle became a very important part of their their strategy because they would do bike-by shootings. And I mean... You have to be a serious biker to make sure your getaway was a success. And a singular bike, okay? So one bike, two girls, and that's how they would take out a lot of their targets. So anyway, they oh. apparently met Honey through the resistance. So she was studying in Amsterdam when the war started, but she was also from a to obviously be against this injustice. 
And when the Jewish students and lecturers were no longer allowed at the university, she refused to sign a pledge pledging loyalty to the Germans. So she had to leave. So she dropped out of university, came back to Harlem, and that's when she got involved in the resistance. With the resistance. But she was very vocal. She didn't just want to do, you know, literature and pamphlets. She made sure that they knew she wanted to do more than just that. Okay. So their aunt, who was sympathetic to the resistance, arranged a room in the hospital where they met Honey for the first time, right? So yeah. they, the two sisters go and Honey arrives, but obviously both parties think the other party could be a German spy because anybody could be a German spy at that point. You, yeah. You're not sure. Of it. And so they're all sitting in this room, silent with their guns out, <laughs> trained on one another. And it's so tense. So eventually they all just start giggling and like can't stop laughing at the absurdity <laughs> of the situation. And I think that's such insight also to the fact that they were just teenage girls. Like because, yep. you know, they're just a bunch of teenage girls in this absurd situation. And from that moment forward, they became best friends. Aww. To the point where they were so good at what they did they were well honey actually was the number one most wanted resistance fighter even hitler wanted her taken out at some point now that's badass <laughs> that is badass and, uh, she was known as the girl with the red hair because she had very vibrant red hair mm-hmm. and if one of the assassinations some a witness noticed this so they knew that there was three girls going around taking out and then eventually yeah. they knew it was three girls and then there was the girl with the red hair that was one of them. And the way, well, the way that that is famous that they used to do it, particularly getting gaining intelligence, they would have to dress themselves up as morph, a morphin mate, which is a Dutch girls who would fraternize with German okay. soldiers. So they would get like dolled up, lipstick, mascara. Like a eye. prostitute. Yeah. But I don't think it was for money. I think it was just for favor. Um, and then go to the bar and like flirt with a certain target and then cleverly get them to divulge information about like and that's how they got intelligence on like the Atlantic wall and what's happening and whatever and then they would relay that back to the resistance Wow! and then sometimes they would suggest a romantic stroll in the woods (laughs) to the soldier who would then go with him only to find their comrades there and then they would kill him. Those soldiers just disappeared. So they would take their uniform, the uniforms would be used for the resistance and they would bury them in the woods. And I was like, oh my God, this is, this is crazy. And at first, was crazy. Like, at first I was like, oh my God, this is so like badass. How is this not a movie? And very like, You know, these girls are seducing and assassinating Nazi soldiers. That is like, yep. What? And then, exactly, because I've never heard of them. Why is this not being, yeah. And then, why is nobody telling the story? The documentary, and I heard Freddie talk about it. So they actually Mm -hmm. took Freddie to the woods, and she hadn't been back there since the war. Okay. Okay. So Freddie hadn't been back there since the war. And then Freddie recounted what it was like the first time they did that. And because she was younger, she was the lookout, right? Okay. So just imagine Freddie, 16, 17. This is the plan. Your older sister is seducing a senior officer. You're the lookout. And she has to get him to the point where there are people who will kill him, right? This can go wrong at any point. The risks that they were facing... I, like I can't even imagine like so Freddie is the lookout and she was saying that she found this big tree and she was so worried that they're going to go in the wrong direction like what if they go in the wrong direction in the woods and I feel like her experience is very often minimized or overlooked or I think people forget how young she was and that mm. she was you know anyway so she was saying how she found this big tree and she was standing there and she was wading and obviously this is before cell phones so it's not like they can let her know the mission was a success you know so she was like she she thought she just had to wait there 
there was obviously some sort of miscommunication. And she said she had a hand on the tree, like this big tree. And she's like, they'll come find me if everything is. Oh, no. Okay. And she was like, she was waiting there with, and she wouldn't move. She didn't want to move because they would they were coming for her. She would just assist yes, her. Yes, because that was the plan. Yeah. And she was saying she couldn't sit because the ground was wet. And she's like, and now you're gonna ask me, but didn't you need to go to the bathroom? But she was so scared that she just ended up like wetting herself oh, and yeah. waiting there yeah. the whole night. And then eventually she I guess realized nobody was coming the next morning mm -hmm. and then goes back to the I guess headquarters or safe house where they were staying to now find her sister and she said that night never left her that night of standing mm -hmm. there so I think it's so easy to get caught up in the these girls were badass but they were just yeah. they were kids with they were kids and it was not fair what they had to do mm. because grown-ups weren't willing to do it, do you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Wow. And even with all that, they did so much good and they saved so many lives. But, you know, that underneath all that, there's still, there's still oh, the yeah. fact that they're babies. Yes through everything and even to the point like where there was one anecdote that they shared where Trish had never put makeup on before right <laughs> because they come from a yeah. background it's wartime that's how they grew up so the guy that actually started the RVV was like putting the makeup on for them but he was just as bad so they were all laughing because they all look <laughs> absolutely horrendous like oh my goodness they're like there's these little I guess human moments that just kind of put things in perspective so uh, there was a couple of missions that they went on that I wanted to share just because I was like oh my god so in one okay. particular mission Honey and Truce were they had a barber who was their target right a Dutch barber. okay this barber had given information to the German intelligence for money and then later became an SS officer so the two women oh. arrive on bikes, right? Because <laughs> that's how they roll. They first, but then her gun failed. Truce then tried to kill him, managed to hit him in his head and in his back, but he survived. His fiance then comes out, sounds the alarm. So the military police is on the way and the guy's not dead. <laughs> oh my goodness. And, like, and this is like how their identities, I guess, started leaking. The fact that it's three women, the fact that one of them has yeah. bright red hair. Things like this, obviously that goes wrong. But then get this, they have to escape, but they can't get away completely. So they flee to a nearby cafe where Truce then pulls out her gun and shouts at everybody in the cafe. Gentlemen, your attention, please. We're coming in now, but when the Germans come in, we've been here all afternoon. If you do not behave in the way we want you to, and we're on our way to heaven, we will take a few of you with us. We do not intend to just give up. Oh, man. <laughs> that, is that is badass. I have, <laughs> I have goosebumps. That is badass. They then proceed to order drinks so that their breath can smell like alcohol. And as mm. soon as the German soldier walks in, Truce throws her arms around him and says, hey, Heinz, come here, and starts groping him and stuff. He's so put off by the whole situation, he just walks out of the cafe and they leave <laughs> get away with it. <laughs> I was like, I didn't even know how they, she managed to come up with that, like, on the spot. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah. But the three of them worked a lot of missions together but one thing that I thought was cool was they actually had like their own private code of ethics so they mm -hmm. developed it within the resistance because sometimes the lines can be blurred and they weren't comfortable yeah. with some of the things that they were being asked so the girls in particular the sisters remembered what their mother said and then yep. so for example hey, exactly so for example one of their rules was they will never do anything involving kids so mm -hmm. even if it is a German officer's kid and there was one situation where that was what the assignment was. They had to kidnap 
one of a senior German official's children. And then they mm. just refused. They were like, actually, we're not going to do that. Mm. Another one of their rules was they always verify the identity of the target with the target. They will never. And that's actually really hard. Like if you have to actually talk to people before you pull the trigger. It's, you don't just kill them. The target must say, yes, I am them before they pull the trigger. Oh, So that's hard because you humanize them in that yeah but and it opens you up to like retaliation because what if the person says yes i am this person and i will kill you now it opens you up to risk but sorry i forgot the one thing was the other the other assignment that they received was an assassination of a woman but she didn't leave the house so it made it tricky for them Mm -hmm. to actually do the assassination and when she did she had her young child with her and that also they said no not doing that yeah because it's a fine line between you being just as bad as the oppressor and Um, with with all them with them saying no they didn't get into trouble with the resistance and that's the really cool thing they were too valuable what were they gonna do okay because they were such valuable assets because they not only were good trained at what they did their liquidations Mm. they were a good shot they were good at strategy like Tris was the leader and apparently honey was usually the brains and freddie usually worked out their roots so how they were going how they would come out so they were a good team they had strengths they were extremely valuable because they were never suspected even after the rumors got out that it was like a young a group of young girls doing the assassination nobody suspected them because that's what it's like when women can't do a thing. Like it's still, <laughs> you know. I mean, <laughs> what do you mean? You pose no threat whatsoever. So yeah. they were like a really great asset for the resistance. And their mother, like, did she know that they were getting up to that they became the so they like, had to move out? And I don't know how yes, much I... contact they were allowed. Okay. Oh no, they weren't allowed to talk know. about any of the liquidations or anything like that. But she didn't know that her kids became these key like players in the resistance i'm not sure i think she must have surely like at some point when the especially when it was going around that it was when she knew Mm. that her girls were one of the were the only girls in the town resistance doing like but you know she might not have because when they were with her they were doing like the pamphlet drops and things like that yeah so she probably thought that they continued on in that vein because truth says that their mothers consented and then the sisters agreed to agree agreed to join and then she says only later did he tell us that what we'd actually have to do sabotage okay. bridge railway lines and learn to shoot to shoot nazis and i remember freddie saying well that's something i've never done before <laughs> <laughs> So I don't think that she she knew because the women who were part of the resistance, usually the part that they played was like the kids and the safe houses because that was the initial mm-hmm. role because they wouldn't be suspected they had a better chance of being successful of actually getting um, yeah. the kids there. And then Freddie in the documentary actually gives an account of the one liquidation that they did, which was of Dickie Waffelbacher who was walking home and she was carrying a terrine of soup because apparently in Nazi occupied Holland, there was a lot of soup kitchens that sprang up or whatever, but she was a retired journalist and a children's book translator, but she was also a Nazi sympathizer and recently created a list list of names and locations of Jews who were hiding in the area Oh shit! and then mailed it off to the secret police. What? What an asshole. What she didn't know was that her letter was intercepted at the post office and passed on to the members of the Dutch resistance. So suddenly, two teenage girls sharing a bike, one pedaling with the other one sitting side saddle on the luggage rack, rides up beside her. Are you Dickie Waffelbacher? One asks. That was Freddie. She was the one who asked. Mm -hmm. Waffelbacher tells them that that is who she is and she walks on. For a few paces, the girls follow behind. Then one of them pulls out a gun and shoots Waffelbacher, killing her instantly. The two jump back up and speed off. 
while Waffle Baka lies dead in the street with soup spilling everywhere. And when Freddie gives her account of it in the documentary, she specifically says that with this particular killing, it was different. And I think this was probably the first woman she had to liquidate because mm. she said it's different with a woman. Mm. Um, when one woman kills another, I guess there's, there's something there. But she says you have to remember who they are and what they did. And she says sometimes there's times when they would shoot somebody, you have this reflex to help them. Like, and it doesn't make any sense because you just shot them. But it's like when a human falls to their knees, your instinct is to help. Is to help. And like that again, just like the amount of scars and trauma, just emotional trauma that these girls went through. Truth said that before a mission, Freddie would get so nervous. She would like, what do you call it? Compulsively eat her handkerchief. And with Truth, she was like, she was fine. She felt fine before a mission fine during the mission but afterwards she would either get faint or she would just start crying hysterically like that's how it Mm. manifested her and with honey before a mission she would like calmly like comb her hair and apply her makeup and then that was like her process I'm interested also about it one day she said that I want to die beautiful oh shit (laughs) so I guess that brings us to (laughs) To a point in 1943. Oh um, no. Are you going to give me a sad ending? (laughs) (laughs) Judging by that laugh, the answer is yes. Can't they just ride off into the sunset and be happy together? So Honey worked very closely (laughs) with the founder of the RVV, who was Jan Bonacamp. So some people said that they think they might have had a romantic relationship. But when I researched Jan Bonnekamp, I found out he had a wife and a daughter who was born in 1940. And then that didn't seem to gel. But I mean, I guess anything can happen in war. But you don't know if they were in love or not. They could have just been, you know, like trauma bond. Um, <laughs> Girl, don't you Anyway, so he, people described him as charismatic, fearless and good looking and apparently he made quite an impression on her and then they were instructed to kill a Dutch police officer police chief and collaborator in Zandam called Willem Ragut the plan was for Honey to shoot first and then for Bonnecam to follow up in case their target didn't die immediately which was a good call because that's exactly what happened so Honey shot he didn't die And then Jan shot, which killed him. But before he was killed, he managed to get a shot. (gasps) And he shot Jan in the stomach. Okay. As long as it wasn't honey. (laughs) (laughs) And then, yeah, so in the chaos that ensued, honey gets away. They end up fleeing in different directions, right? After everything. He, He gets away. He doesn't he shot in the stomach and ends up getting arrested and taken to hospital in hospital don't tell me he flips did he name her he's tricked they drug him right so they give him stimulants it's not to save his life it's to fuck with his psychological situation in hunger games a hunger game situation hunger game situation then a nurse pretends to be sympathetic, pretends to be part of the resistance, one of the nurses. And obviously he's beside himself. They gave him nothing for the pain. He is blind and in pain and dying, basically. She tells him she's part of the resistance and through whatever manages to get Honey's name and address before he dies. So he dies in hospital. Then they arrest Honey. You know what? Can I just say... I just want to say that it's typical that these women manage to be just fine. <laughs> and then a guy fucks it up? A guy? <laughs> so they arrest her. So this is the first time now Honey is in custody, right? They need her to confess. What do they do? They arrest her parents and send them to a concentration camp. She doesn't. She doesn't confess. So, shockingly, she is released, right? 
but she's an emotional wreck, apparently, right. according to the letters that she sent during that yeah. time because of losing Yan, because of her parents in a concentration camp. Luckily, though, after two months, her parents are released. Oh, and thank she goes, goodness. She goes underground. So this is when she changes her appearance because now she's too recognizable, right? She's the girl. You're with playing her. with my emotions? Yeah, just tell me. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> so what happened? she changes her appearance and they actually start using, she dyes her hair black. And she gets glasses made out of window glass. And that's her new look. Her new look. Mm-hmm. And for missions, Clock truce. Kent. Exactly. And for mi- missions, truce would often dress up as a man. So now it wasn't three women anymore. Okay. One with red hair and whatever. So Do you know what? One... I just want to say, sorry to interrupt, but how like, so this whole thing happened. Her parents in a flipping concentration camp losing Yan, her getting arrested, but they don't stop. They're just like, okay, guys, we need to pivot. <laughs> we need to switch the and we carry New on. New hairstyle. Yes. And-, <laughs> and we like just carry on doing the thing. That, now that is badass. That's amazing. Anyway, so Honey is back back in it as now okay. Ravenhead. Honey. New plan. New plan, guys. New plan. <laughs> they then continue with the assassinations and sabotage that they were doing. Okay. Just to kind of segue quickly, there was this one anecdote that I was going to leave out because this is going on so long, but I really want to share it because it's like, how is this real life? So apparently at some point, the sisters were in hiding, Freddie and Truce. Okay. And they were hiding at the Koryten Boom house, which I didn't know about this family, but apparently... They played a very big part in the resistance and they provided like a safe house for a lot of people. But the mm-hmm. house was raided in 1944, right? Okay. And obviously the occupants taken away. But there were six people who were in secret compartments of the house. Get out. If you're <laughs> trying to talk to me about Anne Frank, I'm going to lose my shit. There were six people in the house that were found because they were in secret compartments. And two of those people were... Uh, were Truce and Freddy. Um, they then, the house was then under surveillance. Nice. What? Nice. <laughs> and Frank in the attic? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Different, it's like a different city, different country. Okay. okay. Um, but so they were two of the people who were hiding there. They then. Walls or something. Yeah, probably. I don't know. I didn't um, find out all the details. Okay. The house is then under surveillance, right? Because the police are constantly there. Mm -hmm. So they can't leave. (laughs) They have to escape. They manage to escape eventually through the ceiling. Okay. They go up through the ceiling and now they're on the roof. Then they're running on the roofs of neighboring buildings. Houses, okay. Freddie falls through a skylight. (laughs) And would have died if she didn't, if that wasn't a mattress shop. <laughs> Are you kidding me? And she falls on a mattress. She would have died. <laughs> Brilliant. Anyway, they get out and then they manage to hide until morning and alert the resistance about the other four people that's trapped. And then they manage okay. to save get those four people out. So I just thought that was just like wow. hilarious. <laughs> but also like that was your, and then like you watch the interview with these two women and they're just like these two little old women. And it's like your lives were <laughs> running so across great. like Batman, <laughs> running across rooftops to get away. I mean, under horrendous circumstances, but Yeah. Anyway, let's cut to March 21, 1945, three weeks okay. before the end of the war. Okay. Both Honey and Freddie are stopped at different locations. In- I know they survived because you're talking about a documentary where they're old. So I'm fine. <laughs> I'm fine. Where, where's so- Truce? What's going on with her? <laughs> so- <laughs> so- Honey and Freddie are Don't stopped. Play. There's raids, right? 
Luckily, they're in different parts of the city. Luckily, Freddie hears about the raid. She dumps her bike and her gun in the woods so that when she's stopped by the police officer, she plays the whole, I'm a 15-year-old girl card, and they buy it, yeah. right? And they let her go. Okay. Annie didn't get a heads up. So when she's stopped by the police officer in her getup, they search her and they find... Was Honey in the documentary? <laughs> They find she was distributing an illegal communist newspaper. Yeah, Devade, literally the truth. Okay. But that was a cover story. She was actually transporting secret documentation for the resistance. Okay. Did they find out about that? Yeah, they arrested her. They then found a gun. So she was super arrested. (laughs) Very. She was very arrested at this point. (laughs) At this point, she was very, very arrested. Most arrested than any, anybody has ever arrested before. <laughs> she was then subjected to interrogation, torture, torture. solitary confinement. Mm-hmm. And then eventually, you know, your hair grows out. Oh, God. So her roots gave her away. Oh, my God. And then they knew they had the girl with the red hair. Meanwhile, cut to Truce and Freddy. Honey didn't come back to the headquarters. Now they're freaking out. What does Truce and Freddy do? Obviously, make they don't home. break her out. They got to rescue her. <laughs> I am so invested right now. Please. They, this is amazing. <laughs> why, is it, why isn't there a movie about this? They concocted a plan. Truce disguised herself as a German nurse, and she was going to get into the prison that way and get honey out right so she dresses up as a nurse gets access to the prison gets inside it's in the wrong prison oh my honey god is- guys no one can find her for those though. three weeks then the war's over prisoners are being released all over the city right so truce waits outside with a bouquet of flowers for honey wait she doesn't know wait no they find out what what prison she was actually in but Uh, honey doesn't come out i don't want to hear this please the end okay next week next (laughs) episode um what we did found out happened was that on the 17th of april which was 18 days before the end of the war Two German soldiers took Honey to the dunes of Overveen near Blumendahl and shot her execution style at close range. But get this, she did not just go like that. The first soldier took the shot at close range and he missed. (laughs) (laughs) He missed and he grazes her temple, right? You cannot make me cry on our maiden voyage. She grazes her temple and she, her last words, according to law, is I'm a better shot to her executioner before the other soldier pulls the trigger and that's it. That is the end of Honey <sighs> Shaft. Um, oh in the documentary, they show Freddie who goes to Freddie said when she found out, everybody was celebrating. It was the end of the war, you know. But mm. she and Truce just found out that they lost their best friend. Mm. And she said that she just cried and cried. Nobody could get her to stop crying. And Because they and made it. They made, they made it, it the whole way 18 through. days. 18 days before the end of the war. And what's really annoying is that there was an agreement between the occupier and the Dutch resistance to stop executions. They weren't supposed to execute her. But because their egos were bruised, because this mm. little girl took out so many of them. And by the way, no one actually knows how many liquidations the three of them did because none mm. of them refused to talk about it. They ask, they ask them how many. Yeah. And their answer is, I was a soldier, and you don't ask a soldier that. Mm. So nobody actually knows how many they are responsible for. But like, what really broke my heart is that you can see, I mean, it's been... It's been what seventy years. It's been a life. I don't know. Lady goes back, mm-hmm. and she puts flowers on on Honey's grave. 
And so she's talking about it and she was like, she, what just gets to her is that they took her there alone. Like usually when these executions happen, you could hold somebody's hand. And that's like mm. what she was thinking about. Like she was there alone. And she was like, maybe she was even looking out for us. <laughs> so she said oh my goodness no. <laughs> I am not okay I am not okay she was like maybe she was even looking out for us because we always saved each other <laughs> gonna have to cut this (laughs) (laughs) and that that got me because so i want to know why did they give up if she was standing with flowers outside the prison because they eventually found out where she was why did they then not go save her then if they found out which prison she was in i don't know maybe i don't want this movie anymore (laughs) i don't want this movie so that was Honey Shaft, who was a fucking badass, if if there was one. <laughs> but also, like, just that line from Freddie. I mean, even as it was almost like, yes, this 90 year old woman, but I could see the 17 year old when she said those words. Mm. Because that's how you think. Like, that's how, and I think we all have that girl in us, you know, because it's unreasonable. Of course, they can't save you, but there's that part of you that's a kid that is just looking for somebody to save you. And would yeah. expect that almost to happen, you know? Mm. But you know, when I was researching this story, I was in tears numerous, numerous times. And just to, as a she side She was amazing. Note, as a side note, when they, after the war, when they dug up the dunes for the remains to give them a proper burial, apart from a mass grave, they found the remains of 421 men and one woman. And that woman. <sighs> <laughs> was that he shocked? Wow. So, you know, the sisters made it through the war. Honey was eventually honored, received, you know, after the wars, they went to give out uh, accolades and things. Yeah. And you can't help, like, but ask yourself, where were these people with the power to give out accolades during the war when a 17 year old girl was picking up a gun, you yeah. know? So this isn't a a happy story because after the war, what came after World War II, the Cold War and Mm. the whole global attitude towards communism was like very, very anti-communist. And because the resistance had such strong communist roots, Mm. Freddie and Truce was considered threats because of their communist ties. So they were quite frankly ostracized. They got no recognition for what they did in the war. People were scared of them. They received death threats. And this is apart from dealing with the trauma of actually Mm. killing people and losing charges, children. Truce ended up marrying a fellow resistance fighter and I loved watching her speak about it like so he wasn't in their resistance group he was in like a a different faction but they Mm. would work missions together sometimes and the one mission was blowing up a train they blew up a train (laughs) together oh they meet cute yeah they meet cute and she was like (laughs) so he like set the charge and then they were but there was patrols happening. So the timing, it was very like high tension. Mm. And she says she remembers so they they set it off, they blew up the train, but the patrol was coming. So they had to like hide. And she was so scared. She said, I mean, even even when she was talking about it now, and she was 92. How much time has passed? She even made a visceral sound thinking about it. She was like, yeah. just oh, I was so scared. And like the fact mm. that it's so vivid even now. And she says she just wanted to dig a hole so that she can hide effectively in this dike, but it wasn't possible. So she just stood there and she said, and then she felt him squeeze her hand. (laughs) I was crying when I was looking. (laughs) (laughs) He like squeezed the hand and then she like thought, oh, you know, I I have love or I have a lover or something. I was just like, and then they got married after the, the war. 
And when her daughter talks about it in the documentary, when her mother fell pregnant and she said her father used to like to joke and said, when the brakes came off one day, her mother fell pregnant. <laughs> and then he, but he could see that Truce was having trouble dealing with the PTSD. So both Truce and Freddie frequently got night terrors afterwards. Mm, of course. And, you know, but I guess very luckily for Truce, her husband understood and then, so he, with immense foresight, bought her an easel and paints. And okay. he encouraged her to express herself that way. And she actually became a very renowned artist. The sculptures, she ended up doing a commemorative sculpture of honey that is still in the Netherlands. Oh, wow. So that is so beautiful. That's how she dealt with her, with her war is she made art and she also did a lot of lectures. She spoke about it a lot. She was very vocal about the mm. experience. Whereas Freddie didn't want to speak mm. about it. She also got married and she decided her way of coping was kids, her kids. She gave mm. everything to her family, but it really, really bothered her to the point where she couldn't be around the celebrations around liberation day, okay. the, the trauma. And they actually had to leave as a family. Until eventually, you know, I guess she started talking about it a bit more, mm. started talking to her kids about it. I guess because Freddie is the younger sister, I do kind of feel this affinity for her, I think, because, mm. you know, like Truce was the leader and she's just like a very big personality. And like, I think Freddie kind of shied away from and so after the war I should mention that because of her art and her kind of creating awareness through lectures and things like that Truce received multiple awards and things like that but it should be noted it was for her work after the war nobody mm. ever commemorated the things they did during the war it was almost like they didn't want to talk about it anymore yeah yeah until eventually in 2014 they both received national recognition for their service to the country with a war mobilization cross. And there was also three streets named after the three of them. Truce and Freddie. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, it's a happy story, but it's also sad because it never really left them. They were yeah. dealing with it for the rest of their lives. And of course, I mean, jeez. Because even, so they both, they died at the same age. They both died when they were 92, so two years apart. And okay. Freddie's son says, if you ask me, the war only ended two weeks ago. That's just after his mom passed. Okay. In her mind, it was still going on and on and on. And it didn't stop even till the last day. Because even like in their old wow. age, they were still having their nightmares and things like that. Mm. So... That's my story of Freddie and Truss Overstegen. Overstegen. Jeez, you're not allowed to do this again. The name's wrong, but I was... You're not allowed to do this again. Next episode, you will talk about puppies. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's an amazing, amazing story and such a... Courage. Courage. Because, and specifically, like, when Freddie was standing by the tree... I think a lot of time bravery looks like badass women saying I'm a better shot and, mm. and, and kicking ass and taking no names. Or is it taking names? I taking never names. Right. Kicking ass and taking so, names. But actual courage and bravery, I think, is shown in that vulnerability. The fact mm -hmm. that... They're standing by that tree whole night. That's yes. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's a... It's a big thing, but it's a small thing. Mm. So if that makes sense. No, it does. Um, these women just... <sighs> I was in awe of them. And, okay, there are no subtitles on the documentary, but mm. you can put it in Captionify if anybody wants to watch it. And then I'll also link to a book because they, they actually gave... A lot of the first-hand accounts here is from the book, which is a book by okay. Sarah Polderman, I think her name is. 
but she actually had a very cl- close relationship with the two women because she ended up mm. writing a high school paper about them and then but she lives in Harlem so then she managed to actually phone Truce and got an interview oh, with wow her. and I think it was really amazing because she was 17 at the time and I think mm. Truce saw them in her yeah. and Truce invited her to be the keynote speaker at the unveiling of one of her oh statues. wow it was the statue actually and it's, there's something beautiful about it. These two women handing down like these stories to this woman when she was their age, when they were at war mm. and she's bringing the stories to the world because there's so much more to it. And a lot of the articles that I've read focuses on the girls who seduced and assassinated, but there's so much more to it. And I'm so glad that she wrote the book because it gives mm. a much more intimate account of what, what it was. Mm. actually at the heart of it past the hollywoodization of yeah story they were just two sisters and a best friend but uh, yeah thank you that was an awesome story you're welcome so that's it that's the end of our first episode. We've come to the end of our maiden voyage. It only took 4 billion hours and 17 billion takes. Yeah. But I think we did okay. And if you enjoyed it or if you would like to tell us how much you didn't enjoy it, I guess. Don't don't tell us how much you didn't don't. enjoy it. But feel like, free to leave like questions or ideas or comments or whatever of what you think um, you want us to cover basically anything badass or bookish it's for women. with women at the center if we can or if you can manage that because that's what we'd like the focus of this podcast to be mm-hmm. yeah. subscribe and leave a five star review and tell other people to do the same five stars only thank you <laughs> <laughs> Cool. We'll catch you guys next week.